Welcome to the lecture on forming and maintaining personal relationships. In this chapter, we'll answer the question, why do relationships matter? What do we get out of them? Then we'll look at the nature and really define deeper what a personal relationship is. And once we've done that, we'll look at several theories that help us explain why and how we form relationships and how we maintain those social bonds. And we'll end this lecture by looking at the various stages that relationships go through. First, let's answer that question of why do relationships matter? And this first theory or this first model really tries to explain that by saying that we get some kind of a, a reward out of it. And that reward is generally thought to be a need to belong. And that theory of needing to belong proposes that each of us is born with this innate drive to seek, form, maintain, and really protect the relationships that we have. Now, to fulfill that drive, we use, well, the purpose of this course, we use interpersonal communication to form social bonds with other people. Each of those relationships really helps us feel as though we aren't alone because we belong to someone else or we belong to a social community. Now, besides fulfilling our need to belong, relationships, and particularly close relationships, they bring us, well, all sorts of rewards. Now, in this section of our, of our lecture today, we'll look at three types of rewards that are often intertwined in our relationship. The first is an emotional reward. Our relationships provide us with at least two types of emotional rewards. One is emotional support. Maybe that's encouragement during times of turmoil, whether you're going through a serious crisis or maybe just having a bad day. Close relationships can provide us comfort and empathy to help you make it through. Now, you also have material rewards. A second way that relationships benefit us is by helping us meet our material needs, such as our need for, for money, food, shelter, uh, maybe transportation. We tend to share those types of resources with people with whom we feel close. And then finally, we have health rewards. Now, as we saw in a previous chapter, actually the first lecture, about communication, good relationships can actually keep us physically healthy as well. One study that the textbook references shows that people with strong social network, strong relationships are twice as likely as those without them to survive after, in this example, a heart attack. Now, it's easy to think of the rewards of our relationships. They bring us emotional support, help us during times of need, and even make us healthier. Now, every relationship, relationship in particular, uh, again, those close relationships carries a cost as well as having a reward. Think about what it costs you to be friends with someone else. You might have to spend time with them, with your friend, your, your relation, relational partner. Maybe it's time that you would prefer to spend doing something else. Uh, in addition, you might make an emotional investment, particularly when your friend needs uh, your support. There can also be material costs associated with doing things together, maybe traveling or going out to dinner. And finally, uh, friendships often require physical investment as well. You may not particularly want to help someone move, for example, but you're friends because you do it anyway. Now, most of the time, we decide that the rewards of a strong relationship are worth the cost, and we invest our energies and resources in others because they benefit us as well. We spend our time and money with people because we feel happy when we're around them. And in some cases, however, that cost of staying in that relationship outweighs the reward. So what do you do? In this next section, let's look at what the nature of a personal relationship really, really is. Uh, the nature of a personal relationship close relationships require commitment. Now, commitment is our desire to stay in a relationship no matter what happens. When people are committed to each other, they, they assume they have a long future together. Now, that assumption is important because most close relationships, such as a friendship or, or, or romantic pairs, experience conflict and they experience distress from time to time. Now, what allows us to deal with those difficult times is the belief that a relationship will survive them. Our close relationships also usually include some level of emotional commitment also. But that's a sense of responsibility for each other's feelings and emotional well-being. Some close relationships are bound by legal and financial commitments as well, which are more formal expressions of people's obligations to each other. Think about being married. 
Now, close relationships also foster interdependence. Uh, really, another hallmark or characteristic of a close relationship is that they include high states or high degrees of interdependence. And that means that what happens to one person affects everyone else in the relationship. Interdependence is a state in which a person's behaviors affect everyone else. And closer relationships usually have a very high level of interdependence among them. Close relationships also require continuous investment. So you have uh, investments as well. Close relationships usually have uh, one's energies and other resources committed to that relationship. Now we invest a range of resources in our close relationships, including, again, what we talked about, the, the costs, time, money, attention, physical energy. And generally, we expect to benefit from our investments, just like we benefit from maybe uh, a 401k or a stock or a bond or something in your portfolio. You want a return on that investment. But we know we can't retrieve the resources we've dedicated to the relationships if it comes to an end. Now, people in close relationships are often especially aware of how much or how equitably they are investing. For, for example, research in the text shows that spouses are happiest when they feel they are both investing in the relationship to roughly the same degree. Now, if you think you're putting more time or resources, energy, or money into your relationship than the other person is, you're not getting those rewards, you're not getting that return, it's really easy to feel resentful. Now, the most satisfying close relationships appear to be those in which both parties are investing equally. Close relationships, however, also can spark this concept called dialectical tension. Now, what that means is the feeling as though you wanted to be closer to someone but you also wanted to maintain your individuality. Uh, in your relationships, have you ever thought about being more, have, uh, you wish to have more self-disclosure, but you still wanted to keep some thoughts private. Maybe you enjoy the novelty and the surprise in your relationships, but you also want them to be stable and predictable. If you can relate, you have experienced what the text and researchers refer to as dialectical tension. And that's again, a conflict between two important but opposing needs or desires. And typically, they're measured in three ways. The first is this concept of autonomy versus connection. Autonomy versus connection is a common tension in intimate relationships, and that's between the feeling of wanting to be one's own person, autonomy, and connection, the desire to be close to others. Another dimension that causes dialectical tension is openness versus closedness. And this is a dialectical tension uh, that, where that you have a desire for disclosure and honesty, the openness, and closedness, the desire to keep certain facts, thoughts, or ideas to oneself. And the final dimension is predictabil predictability versus novelty. Many close relationships experience conflict between predictability, the desire for consistency, stability, might be kind of boring, and novelty, exciting and new, the desire for something fresh and a new experience. Now, dialectical tensions are normal, and they're part of any close, interdependent relationship, and they become problematic only when people feel, or rather fail, to manage that tension properly. And here are some ways that people, good and bad, manage them properly. Denial. This strategy involves responding to only one side of the tension and ignoring the other. A disorientation strategy. This strategy involves escaping the tension entirely by ending the relationship. Alternation. Alternation strategy means going back and forth between the two sides of attention. Segmentation involves dealing with one side of attention in some aspects or some segments of one's relationship and dealing with the other side of the tension using other segments. Balance. People who use balance as a strategy try to compromise or find that middle ground between the two opposing forces of attention. Integration. Uh, in this strategy, people try to develop behaviors that will satisfy both sides of attention simultaneously. Recalibration helps you adapt and reframe a tension so that the contradiction between opposing needs disappears. And then finally, reaffirmation. Reaffirmation means simply embracing dialectical contention as a normal part of life. We've considered why relationships matter so far and how they reward us. 
Uh, next, let's look at several theories that explain the various interdependent interpersonal forces that work to form and develop our relationships. And also, what makes some relationships closer than others. Uh, some of these theories help us to really understand with whom we choose, why we choose to choose, why we choose to form relationships with certain people. The first theory that we'll look at in terms of how we form and maintain social bonds is attraction theory. The process of forming the most the process of forming most relationships begins with interpersonal attraction, which is, by definition is any force that draws people together. Now, you're probably already familiar with the concept of attraction, physical attraction, or by being drawn to someone because of his or her mother well, looks. There are at least two other ways to be attracted to a person. One is social attraction, which means being attracted to someone's personality. For example, you might like your new neighbor because their attitude. Likewise, you might be drawn to a classmate uh, or someone you work with because they're really, really funny. And then finally, a third kind of attraction is task attraction. Task attraction is being attracted to someone's abilities and their dependabilities. Now, a variety of qualities in new acquaintances can spark the forces of interpersonal attraction. However, the research suggests that there are four especially powerful factors, personal appearance, proximity, similarity, and complementarity. It's hard to say. First, we are attracted by appearance. We are still animals at nature. And when we say a person is attractive, we also mean that he or she looks attractive. We are talking about physical appearance. We're highly, as animals, humans, are visually oriented. So when we find someone to be physically attractive, we're often motivated to get to know that person better. There are at least two reasons why we behave that way. One person, one reason is that we value or appreciate physical attractiveness. So we want to be around people who we consider to be attractive. Another reason is that throughout history, humans have thought physically attractive persons as mates because attractive people often have particularly healthy genes. Children produced with attractive people are more likely to be healthy because they will inherit those healthy genes. Next, we're attracted by or through proximity. Another important predictor of attraction is, again, proximity, which means how close, physically close together people live or work and how often they interact. Now, we're more likely to form and maintain relationships with people we see often, more so than we people we don't. Uh, we tend to know our next door neighbors, our colleagues that we work with in the same building because, because we see them all the time. Uh, and we're more likely to become friends and maintain relationships with our co-workers uh, than people that we rarely, uh, rarely, rarely see. We're also attracted by similarity. You've probably had the experience of getting to know someone and really marveling at how much you think you have in common. When we meet people with those backgrounds and experiences, beliefs that are similar to ours, we find them to be, we find them to be comfortable and familiar to be around. I've known you for so long, it feels like. Sometimes it's almost as if we already know them and, and perhaps, however, you've heard that cultural outage that opposites attract, which suggests that we are more drawn to people who are rather actually different from us. Now, we're also attracted by complementarity. Now, even though we're attracted by similarity, however, we can be also be attracted to people who are different from ourselves, that opposites attract. That is, a, as beneficial to ourselves because they're different because they provide a quality or something that we lack. Another theory in terms of how we form and maintain social relationships is called URT, Uncertainty Reduction Theory. And it suggests we get to know people in order to reduce our uncertainty about them. Uh, this one is, let's say you meet someone and you think you might want to get to know that person better. What does it mean? Here's the question. What does it mean to get to, to know them better? Uh, this theory says, that when you first meet a new coworker or a new classmate or maybe somebody at the gym or at church, you don't know how much you don't know much about them. So your uncertainty level is very high. And this theory suggests that you will find uncertainty to be very unpleasant. So you'll be motivated to reduce your uncertainty by using certain behaviors to get to know that person. At first you'll probably talk about basic information, where you live, where they live, where you work, and so on. Then as you get to know them, 
they'll probably disclose more personal information about themselves and about yourself as well. And you may also learn information about this person by paying attention to nonverbal cues, such as appearance, voice, gestures, emblems, and so forth. According to this theory, each new piece of information you gain reduces your level of uncertainty. Now, it's important. Uncertainty theory also suggests that the less certain you are, the more you like the person. Because we dislike being uncertain about people, we will also, uh, we like people more as our uncertainty about them decreases. Now, we just learned in uncertainty reduction theory that as your uncertainty about your new coworker or new colleague is reduced, you'll probably like them more. But now, what happens if you don't like the information you learn about the other person? Will you still like this person more now that you've, even though you've gotten the information, as in you've gotten to know them better? Now, one of the new theories that we're looking at it looks at things slightly differently. It says that we, uh, in predicted outcome value theory, it suggested that when we first communicate with others, we try to determine whether, oh, shit. Now, as we just learned in uncertainty reduction theory, as our uncertainty about a new coworker or a new classmate is reduced, you probably will like him uh, more. Now, what happens, though, if you don't like the information you learn about the other person? A certain reduction says you're going to like them, but that's not always the case. You might not like the information you're getting. Are you still going to, uh, will you still like her, him or her more and want to get more information from them, get to know them better? Predicted outcome theory offers a different way to think about how we form relationships. In predicted outcome value theory, it suggests that when we first communicate with others, we try to determine whether continued communication with them will be worth our effort. We're predicting the outcome. If we... There we go. If we like what we learn about someone during our initial conversations, we predict positive outcomes for future communication with that person, meaning we'll want to get to know that person better. In contrast, uh, if we don't like what we learn about someone during our initial conversations, we predict negative outcomes uh, for future communications, and we don't feel motivated to continue to get to know him or her better. We're likely going to avoid avoid that person and engage in what's called avoidance behaviors. And these are communication behaviors that signal a lack of interest. As with approach behaviors, avoidance behaviors include verbal and nonverbal actions, maybe please leave me alone, uh, nonverbal behaviors such as avoiding eye contact or avoiding the person or not spending time with him or her at all. Another theory on how we form and maintain social relationships is called social exchange theory. Theories about costs and benefits, that's what really this, this exchange theory looks at. Now, suppose you've been drawn to someone, you're attracted to someone, you've gotten to know them, and the, and the two of you have become friends. Uh, at some point, you've completed the process of forming a relationship. Got that. How will you decide, though, whether you want to stay in that relationship or just let it you know, fizzle out? One way is by examining that give and take of a relational cost and benefit. And social exchange theory does a good job looking at that. Social exchange theory is, uh, has a guiding principle that states that people seek to maintain relationships in which their benefits uh, outweigh their costs, not rocket science. Think of a relationship with, with your neighbor or somebody at work. There are costs involved in being neighborly uh, and being a good coworker. You have to be willing to help them when they need it. Uh, and there are also benefits to that relationship, such as knowing someone can help you on a project. Uh, the question, though, is whether you think the benefits outweigh the costs. If you do, then you're likely to maintain that relationship. If not, then you'll let that, uh, you're less inclined to maintain it. And you'll let it uh, just kind of fizzle out. Now, an important concept in social exchange theory is your comparison level which is your realistic expectation of what you want and think you deserve from a relationship. Equally important is your comparison level for alternatives. That current relationship, that concept kind of speaks to your assessment of how good or how bad your current relationship is compared with your perceived options. Your expectations are based on both your experiences with relationships and the prevailing cultural norms for that type of relationship. We seek relationships in which our comparison level equals or exceeds our comparison level for alternatives. 
Another theory that seeks to explain how we form and maintain social relationships is called equity theory. Now, if you think of relationships as having costs and rewards, uh, then it's easy to see that both people in a given relationship might not benefit equally. Equity theory borrows the concepts of cost and reward from social exchange theory and extends them by defining a good relationship as one in which your ratio of costs and rewards is equal to your partner's. You can be over-benefited, which means you're receiving more from the relationship than you are giving, or you can be under-benefited, giving more to the relationship than you are receiving. So how do you maintain that relationship? Uh, through certain relational maintenance behaviors like positivity, openness, assurances, social networks, and sharing of tasks. And look, let's look at each one of those in, in order. Positivity, these are behaviors that entail positivity to make other people comfortable around us. Positivity behaviors include acting friendly, cheerful, being courteous, and refraining from criticizing other people. People who engage in positivity behaviors smile more, express their affection and appreciation for others, and don't complain. Openness. Openness describes a person's willingness to talk with his or her friend or relationship partner about their relationship. People who use this relational maintenance strategy are likely to disclose their relationships and feelings, ask how their friends feel about the relationship, and confide in their friends. An assurance strategy, these are verbal and nonverbal behavior, non behaviors that people use to illustrate their faithfulness and commitment to others. A statement like, uh, of course I'll help you, you're my friend, sends the message that communicates uh, that the communicator is committed to the relationship and it reassures the other person that the relationship has a future. Social networks. Now today, when we think of social networks, we think of Facebook, Instagram, uh, and, and so on. But uh, what we really term, what we really mean by social networks it refers to all of the relationships that one has, online and offline as well. Now, an important relational maintenance behavior is to share one's social networks with another person. And then finally, sharing tasks. As the term suggests, sharing tasks means performing one's share, uh, fair share in the work of maintaining that relationship. So, so far we looked at some of the costs and rewards of a relationship and how we maintain them. Next, let's look at the various stages that relationships go through, both up and down. Researchers have found that people follow fairly consistent steps when they form new relationships. Relationship formation involves five stages. That's in the boxes on the bottom two. Initiating, experiencing, initiating, experiencing, intensifying, integrating, and bonding. Uh, these stages can de describe the development of in really any kind of personal relationship, whether they're romantic, platonic, social, professional, whatever, although they're often applied primarily to re romantic relationships. So although they apply to just about any relationship, it's kind of focused a little bit on the uh, re romantic part. First, you have initiating. The initiating stage occurs when people meet and interact for the first time. Experiment. Experimenting. Now, suppose you begin talking with someone you find interesting. You might then move to the experimenting stage, during which you have conversations to learn more about that person. Things go well, then it intensifies. During this stage, people move from being acquaintances to becoming friends. They spend more time together, and they might uh, begin to meet each other's friends, co-workers, relatives, and so forth. The integration stage occurs when a deep commitment has formed, and people uh, share a strong sense that the relationship has its own identity. At that point, point, you can move into the bonding stage. And this is the final stage where the partners make a public announcement of their commitment to each other, uh, integrating with each other. And they also begin to think of themselves as a pair, not just you and me or you and I, but they use collective pronouns like we. Now, just like you have a relationship model that shows how relationships are formed, the inverse is also true. How do you get out of the relationship? There is such a thing as relationship dissolution. Just as relationships develop and form over time, we also need a model that kind of explains how they unwind. They can come apart over time. Also five stages. Differentiating, circum circumscribing, stagnating, avoiding, and terminating. Let's look at each one of those in order. Differentiating. 
Just like you can say that a relationship was coming together and you're forming collective pronouns, people in close relationships similar to each other in some ways and different in other ways where you start accentuating those differences. In happy, stable relationships, people see their differences as complementary. But in this stage, people start seeing their differences as undesirable or annoying. Circumscribing. Circumscribing. This is when partners in a close relationship enter the circumscribing stage. They're starting to decrease the quality and the quantity of their communication with each other. The purpose in doing so is to avoid dealing with conflict. At this stage, people start spending more time apart. Yet, However, when they're together, you usually don't talk about problems, disagreements, or sensitive issues, and they just ignore them. They stick to stay safe topics. Stagnating. Stagnating, if circumstance, circumstances keep progressing or digressing to the point where the partners are barely speaking to each other, the relationship enters this stagnating phase in which, uh, in which time the, really the relationship stops growing and people feel as if they are just you know, going through the motions. They avoid communicating, they avoid doing anything together. Many relationships stay stagnant for a long period of time. Four out of five, avoiding. When people decide they are no longer willing to live in a stagnant relationship, they enter the avoiding stage, during which time they create a physical as well as an emotional distance between each other. And then finally, you have terminating. The last stage is the termination stage, at which point the relationship is officially judged to be over. Thank you for listening to the lecture on forming and maintaining personal relationships.